Hello, and welcome to the University of Maryland Extension's 4-H HealthRocks training videos for lessons 13 and 14. My name is Michelle Harmon, University of Maryland Extension 4-H Program Assistant in Garrett County. An important part of making a good decision is basing it on facts and accurate information. The first step in making a decision is to identify what the decision is. Sometimes this is easy and sometimes it is more difficult. Once the decision to be made is identified, you need to think of all of the options of choices that can be considered. How can just one option be chosen? Sometimes it feels like being a child in a candy store. Options need to be prioritized and consequences for each option need to be considered requiring the gathering of information or recollection of facts that youth may already know. Once all of this has been done, an informed decision can be made. The energizer for this week is a fun game called Be Unique. This classroom game is about being unique and getting to know each other better. Everyone stands in a circle. Every student has something to say that is unique about themselves. For example, one might say, I have four brothers. If another student also has four brothers, the students who share the not so unique aspect have to sit down. The goal is to stand as long as possible and therefore to share very special things about yourself that no one else typifies. An important part of making a good decision is basing it on facts and accurate information. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper to get all of the information that we may need to make an informed decision. Before showing the video for this lesson, give each student a copy of the Ranking the Options handout. During the video, they will be asked to rank choices based upon the information they are given. We will now watch the video for lesson 13. Health rocks, inspired to be substance free. So today we're gonna to be talking about making decisions and how important it is to be able to have all of the information to make an informed decision. So we have a little exercise that we're gonna do. So you'll need to get a piece of paper and a pencil. While you're getting that, I'm gonna to explain to you what we're going to do. I've got four bags here behind me. You don't know what's in the bags, but I can guarantee you there's something in every one of them. Now, first of all, I want you to think about these bags. Look, just looking at them. And I'd like you to rate them one to four as to which one would be your most desirable bag. If you had to pick one of these bags, which one would it be? So just because we're doing this over camera and virtually, I'm gonna go ahead and explain a little bit about the bags to you um, just to make sure you know exactly what you're looking at. So here is just a gift bag. Uh, this is more of a duffel bag. We have a purse and then just a cinch sack backpack, okay? So I want you to write down in order, rank them from highest to lowest, which ones you would find to be the most desirable bags. So bag one, two, three, four, put them in order. Now, after you've done that, we're going to look at the weight of the bags. If we were able to do this in person, I would allow you to come and pick up each one of the bags to feel for it yourself. But unfortunately, we are not allowed to do that at this point. So I'm gonna lift them up and kind of tell you a little bit. This one is heavy. You can see that it's very heavy. <laughs> okay. This one is really light. Doesn't really feel like there's much in this one. Okay. This one's not as heavy as the first one, but it feels like there's something in there. This one feels like nothing. Feels really light, but it is closed, so I don't know if there's something in there or not. Okay, so I want you to do the same thing again. I want you to rank these bags from one to four, telling me which ones you think would be the most desirable. Now, I want you to think about these bags You've had to make a decision based solely on the outside appearance of the bag and what it felt like picking it up, or at least what I told you it felt like when I picked it up. 
Do you think that you have all of the information that you need to make an informed decision if you had to pick one of these bags and you were told you're going to get to keep whatever's in the bag? Do you think you have enough information to make that informed decision? I'd be curious to see which bag you chose. So looking at these bags again, I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to show you what's inside. This is a little bit like a game show, right? Do you want deal number one or deal number two? Okay, so we're looking at the bags now. This was a very heavy gift bag that was full of a bottle of vinegar. Maybe not the best choice if this is the bag that you chose. Next, we have a duffel bag. Nice size duffel bag, but it was really light. Inside here, we have woo, envelope of cash. This would have been the top choice, I tell you. So, here we have a purse. Nice purse with a candle. And then we have the cinch sack here that felt very light. And inside here we have a variety of face masks. Now, going back through and looking at what you chose as your top choices on these bags, how'd you do? What were the consequences of not knowing what was inside the bags when you were given the choice to choose one of these. Did you choose well? Did you end up with the cash? Or did you end up with a bottle of vinegar because you were thinking heavy is good? So these are some things to think about. This is a great illustrative way to show you how important it is to have all of your information as you're making a decision. Now, when you're going through the decision-making steps, as we discussed before, the first step is to identify the decision to be made. So we did that. We knew we had to pick one of these bags. That was the decision to be made. The next thing is to find our options. Well, our options were one through four right here. Next, we need to look at the positives and negatives for each one of our options. Now that could have been done in a number of ways and it is also a very personal choice. If you really like pink, maybe you would go with the pink gift bag. It's your favorite color, you like the polka dots. You're thinking gift bag equals presents equals maybe a really good thing. Perhaps you liked the bigger bag and you wanted to go with the duffel bag and you were thinking that's a good thing. Mm, it's light, but who knows, light could be good. Maybe you chose the purse thinking, well, that's a pretty nice purse. Even if there's nothing in it, it's a nice purse or you know, had a little bit of weight to it. Maybe there was something good in it. Maybe you went for the cinch sack thinking, this is obvious, it's light, it's the worst bag there. Obviously it has the best thing in it. So those are some pros, cons, thinking about how you went through this decision process. And it could have been entirely different for you. The decision making process is a very individual kind of thing. And it's going to be based on a lot of what you think, what you feel, what your priorities are. Now the consequences. Were there consequences of what you chose here? This was not a huge decision. It was virtual, it really didn't mean anything, but it gave you an idea. It gave you an idea that there can be consequences for your choices. Positive consequences, picking the duffel bag with the envelope of cash. Eh, negative choices maybe, picking the gift bag with the gallon of vinegar. These are some things I want you to think about and I want you to remember these decision-making steps because as you go forward and as you do these steps more and more, it'll become easier for you and it'll become like second nature to think through the decision-making steps before you make a decision. And it could be at some point, it might save you from making a bad decision. As you make each decision, big ones and little ones, think about your choices, your options that you have before you make the decision. Try to think about the positive effects and the negative effects from each of those decisions and think about what consequences may come as a result of those decisions. Like I said, it'll get easier. The more you do it, the easier it will get. After watching the lesson video, discuss with the youth how they ranked the bags. You may use the following questions to help lead the discussion. How many of you changed your rankings each time you ranked the bags? Why? 
If students are not sure why, explain that as they gathered more facts and information with each ranking, it made it easier to make the best decision. Did your rankings differ from your friends? Why? Explain that as each person differs, so do their decisions. What may be the best for one person is not necessarily the best for another. Next, you will hang up the four test versus movie option signs on four different walls of the room. The signs are study and don't watch the movie, watch the movie, then go to bed, decide you will just cheat on the test, watch the movie and stay up really late to study. Explain that they are to make a decision about watching a movie when studying for a test. One at a time, have the youth select and read a test versus movie information card. Then go over the options. Giving youth only five seconds to decide, have youth go to the card that has the decision that they would make. The card situations are, your boyfriend, girlfriend, friend wants to watch the movie with you. The test is in chemistry and you want to be a doctor. Your parents forbid you to watch the movie because it is rated R. You dislike the teacher. You are the only one in your friend group who hasn't seen the movie. You have a D in this class. The test doesn't count much towards your grade. Your parents will be gone or the movie will be shown in theaters next week. You may use the following questions to lead a brief discussion after each card is read. Why did you move to a particular sign? Did everyone agree on the same decision? Why or why not? You would continue this until all of the situation signs have been read. These questions can be led to lead a discussion on a reflection from this week's lessons and activities. Why do you think people ranked the bags differently? Why is it important to gather as much information as possible before making a decision? Each time you ranked the bags, what did you base your information on? Did you have all of the facts and information? How does that make a difference? Do you agree with the movie versus test options selected for each situation? Why or why not? What are some of the consequences of the choices for the movie versus test options? Are they short-term, intermediate, or long-term consequences? Do you make decisions in real life in the same way you did with the bags? What are some examples? There are many times that we make decisions without having all of the facts or possibly even with information that is not reliable. How would you decide if you are getting good information? When making a decision, what kinds of questions should you ask yourself or others to gain new information? How can you use what you have just learned in making decisions about tobacco, alcohol, or other drugs? We may not always have enough time to go through extensively each one of these steps in the decision-making model. However, as the demonstration with the bags has shown, it can be important to take time to think about decisions before we make them. The 4-H activity this week will be based on a lesson developed by the exploration team from University of Maryland Extension. We will only be using a portion of this lesson. In this lesson, students will learn about animal byproducts or co-products and their uses. Students will also learn about the creation of value added products by making a milk based glue. You may begin the lesson by giving the students some background information. Our ancestors domesticated animals and began raising them to provide food such as meat, milk and eggs and fiber such as wool or mohair to meet their needs. Most animals are raised for one or two specific products. However, after an animal is harvested for its primary products, there are some things left over that have to be dealt with. Some of these leftovers are simply waste. 
but much of the leftovers can be used or made into useful products. These products are called co-products or byproducts. Animal byproducts play a significant role in society. Although this lesson focuses on animals, plant byproducts and co-products can also be important to us. People who work in agriculture have a goal of converting animal and plant co-products and byproducts into value-added products. When an item is value-added, it means that the item's value has been increased by altering or improving the item in a way that makes it more useful. An example of a value-added byproduct is biofuel made from animal fat. We do not raise animals primarily for their fat, but animal fat can be processed into a value-added product that is useful to society. The creation of value-added products helps to reduce agricultural waste and generates more income for the agriculture community. Next, you will want to engage the students. Ask for a few volunteers. Tell students that you need several sharp pencils. Have volunteer students come forward and have each one sharpen a pencil. Using a handheld pencil sharpener, ask what occurs when pencil is sharpened. What have you produced other than a nice sharp pencil? This is an example of byproducts or co-products that result from the creation of useful products. We obtain a sharp pencil, which is the primary product, but we have a byproduct, which is the pencil shavings. How can we use the pencil shavings? Will they provide us with anything useful? Have your students take a few moments to discuss this and find out if they can come up with any sort of byproduct or co-product that may use the pencil shavings. Now the students will have a chance to make glue. We will watch a video created by the exploration team to demonstrate this activity. Hi guys, this is David from the Ag Exploration Team and I'm here today to give you some helpful hints and show you how to do the activity that goes along with the food fiber and more lesson. So basically in the activity you're going to make glue which is an animal byproduct. Um, so this is all the stuff that you're going to need to use the activity. Uh, I will caution you and say that the activity can get a little messy but that just makes the kids like it even more. So um, the things that you'll need to do the activity, you'll need two bowls. Um, any size bowls will work. We found this is a good size. They don't need to be too big. We're not making a huge amount of measuring stuff, so this is a good size. Um, they need coffee filters. In the lesson it says one. We found it's better to give the kids two coffee filters. When they get wet they could rip and tear and that makes a mess, so just giving them two adds a little extra layer of protection. You need uh, dry milk. Uh, you can find this in any grocery store um, and you just need the little packets like this. It doesn't take a ton, so one box should go pretty far. Uh, or you can use regular milk. If you use regular milk, um, you're going to need to heat it up first. Um, you'll need regular white distilled vinegar, baking soda, some type of stirring implement. We give all the kids uh, just a regular spoon. They can have forks, other things too. Uh, and your measuring cups. So the ones that you'll definitely need, a quarter cup, one tablespoon, quarter teaspoon, um, all those. You can use basically any measuring cups and if you don't have the right ones you can make the kids even convert the ones that you do have into what we need for the lesson. Uh, and then the last thing if you're using the dry milk you need to have hot water because um, our first step is going to be making that milk. But this is all the stuff that you need to do the lesson. Alright so now we get to the fun part, the actual activity and we're going to make glue. So the first thing I always do uh, to do this activity is print out the activity sheet that's in the curriculum. I've probably taught this lesson 25-30 times but I still like to have this with me as a reference so that I can make sure I'm doing the steps right. Uh, we've printed it out and given it to the kids before too, you can do that so they can follow along uh, but we've also found that if you give it to them they tend to jump ahead and not pay attention and not listen so it might be better just for you to give the directions. You can decide how you want to do it for your group of kids. Um, so basically step one is we're going to make milk. Um, so if you're using the dried milk, you need to get that now. You need one bowl. Uh, so if they have the other bowl, um, they can put the filters in, the, uh, in it and lay it to the side. We'll get to using that later, but you just need one bowl to start. So if you're going to make milk, we need to start by getting two tablespoons of the dried milk. Into our bowl and a quarter cup of hot water. 
And we found the, the warmer, the hotter the water, the better the mixture, the better the reactions that we've gotten. Um, again, this step is just basically making milk to start the process. So once they've got the water and the dried milk together, they just need to stir it up with their spoon or stirring implement, whatever you've given them. And they just want to get it nice and smooth like normal milk would be. Now if you are going to use normal milk, and this question has come up before, all you need is a quarter cup of warm milk. You don't need to add water to the milk. That will make it just waterier. So we have made our milk. Now we're going to begin by starting with our chemical reactions. So in this next step, you need your vinegar. Just regular white distilled vinegar works, and you only need a tablespoon of it. Now it's important to tell the kids before they pour it in that they're gonna to wanna to notice the reactions that are taking place and kind of note and write down what's happening. So you just need a tablespoon of vinegar, and then just dump it into your milk. And you're going to see stuff happening right away. And then you're going to want to just stir. Basically, what you're going to see is all these solids starting to form. And this is very similar to the nursery rhyme everybody knows from they were little with Little Miss Muffet, um, because we are getting our curds and whey here. So the curds are the solids that are forming in the milk, and the whey is the liquid. Now you can tell them we've even made two byproducts here, the curds and the whey. The whey can be used to feed the animals. And this is the same process that we would be using if we were going to make cottage cheese or regular cheese and getting this, these curds out of there. So once it's mixed up pretty well, um, this is where our Nux bowl and the coffee filters come in. So we in the lesson say that you need to give them at least one coffee filter. We found it's better to give them two in case that one rips. You've got another one for, for protection. So you basically just pour the mixture you just created into the coffee filter. And we're trying to get all the solids and the liquids separated. So this part can become a little messy um, because they kind of need to squeeze a little bit to drain that out. With the dried milk, some of it clumps really, really well, so you might not even need to squeeze that much. They can just kind of pick the, the thicker lumps out. But if you squeeze it to get all the way out, you're left with those curds, nice solid. So basically, once you get that separated out, just put it back in the other bowl again. Set this aside, that's gonna be your discard bowl. And once you've got the curds or the solids out, we're going to take the spoon and just kind of chunk it up as much as you can, okay? And you're just breaking it up to try to get smaller pieces so that when you go to mix your glue, it'll be smoother in the end. So there you go, it's just kind of broken up into those smaller pieces. Now comes our measuring part again. So we have measurements down on the sheet for you. Um, those aren't exact, um, and basically we're just gonna create glue to the consistency that um, we want it. Um, so we'll start by adding a quarter tablespoon of baking soda to the mixture. and then a teaspoon of water. And again, you want to tell the kids to kind of note what's happening um, because those are questions on the follow-up worksheet. And then once you get it, just stir it together. But you're gonna see some bubbling, you might hear some hissing as the baking soda and water get mixed together. And now you're just going for the consistency that you want. It can be thicker like, um, like a glue stick or you can get it nice and thin if you want more like a regular bottle of glue would be. Just keep mixing and mixing until you have it the way that you want it. Mine's pretty good. So we've made glue.
Uh, now we, we like to let the kids use the glue to do something. At Thanksgiving we've made turkeys, at Valentine's Day we made Valentine's, but the kids want to see if the glue works, and it does. It does need to sit a little bit to dry, um, but you can let them use it. Um, the other questions that we get from the kids is can they eat the glue? And we've got it from elementary schoolers and high schoolers, so the answer is yes. It's perfectly human, humanly safe to eat. Uh, it's not going to taste very good though. Uh, and then finally, you, you can store this glue. You need to put it in the refrigerator because it does have milk product in it, um, but you can store it for a day or two and use it um, and it'll work just fine. And that's the uh, how you make glue portion of the lesson. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Well, thanks for making glue with me today, guys. Hopefully you found that useful. And for more helpful tips or to get any one of our other 21 lessons, you can go to our website. That's extension.umd.edu backslash exploration. After the students have had the opportunity to make their glue, you may offer them a few pieces of paper to glue together. While the students are given the chance to use their glue, you may offer this explanation of the process. In the preceding activity, an animal product, milk, was turned into a new value-added product, glue, using chemical interactions and reactions. This was accomplished by employing the scientific principles of acids, bases, and proteins. The pH or relative acidity or basicity of milk is near neutral, a pH of seven. Adding vinegar, which has a pH of two to four, causes the proteins in the milk to denature or coagulate into curds because milk protein clumps together when acid is introduced into neutral milk. Milk protein is called casein, and it is an ingredient in various food products at, used as a binding agent. The watery substance after the casein precipitates is called whey. Baking soda, a buffer, is added to neutralize the vinegar. A buffer is a compound that neutralizes acids and bases in a mixture. The neutralization process releases carbon dioxide, which is why you may observe bubbling when the baking soda is added. Adding the buffer allows the casein molecules to bind together and form a smooth glue. Moving on to lesson 14. Decision making is a skill that is important for everyone to know. Each day youth face numerous decisions and problems. Problem solving is really about making a series of decisions. Sometimes problems may arise because of a poor decision. It is important to have the tools and skills to handle decisions well. Good decision making skills help youth avoid making poor decisions about tobacco, alcohol, and drug use. The energizer that we will use for this lesson seems simple at the outset, but can cause a great deal of hilarity. First, you will brief the participants by asking all of them to stand up. Let them know that you are going to give them instructions on which direction to look. They have to turn their head, only their head and not their body, and look in the appropriate direction. When you say up, the participants will look up. When you say down, the participants will look down. When you say left, the participants should turn their heads to the left and when you say right, the participants should turn their heads to the right. Say the words up, down, left, and right in random order and encourage the participants to follow your directions. Keep giving the directions at a fairly rapid pace. Keep this up for a minute or two. Next, we will change the meaning of the words. From now on, up will mean down and down will mean up. So when you say down, the participants should look up. And when you say up, the participants should look down. Explain that the meaning of the words left and right will not change. Call out the four directions in a random order and ask the participants to follow the directions. Remind them that they have to remember the new meaning of the words up and down. You will see many mistakes and a lot of embarrassed laughter. Announce the end of the activity after about another minute. 
Ask the participants how difficult it was to follow instructions when the meaning of the words were changed. Ask them to discuss any similar experiences they may have had in their real life. One learning point that you may point out for this activity is that it's difficult to learn new concepts without learn unlearning some old concepts. The old way of doing things interferes with learning new procedures. Decision making is a skill that is important for everyone to know. Problem solving is really about making a series of decisions. Sometimes problems may arise because of a poor decision. It is important to have the tools and skills to handle decisions well. We will now watch the video for lesson 14. Health rocks, inspired to be substance free. We're gonna talk again today about making decisions. Now we've talked about the steps of making decisions and we've talked about the importance of making informed decisions. So there's one other thing that can affect your decisions and that's your emotions. Many of us make emotional decisions. I know I do, so I'm sure many of you probably do too. You may even do it without even thinking about it, without realizing that there are emotions that are clouding your judgment and influencing the kind of decisions that you make. So I would like to read to you a few instances and circumstances, and I want you to think about what emotion that you feel when you hear these. Okay, so put my cheaters on here so I can see. All right, so when I read this, I want you to think about what is the first emotion that you feel. Your mom invites you to go shopping for shoes. Now, for some people, that might cause a feeling of excitement, and for others, it might be a sense of complete dread. Your best friend talks badly about you. This can never end well. This is gonna be something that might cause feelings of sadness or maybe even anger. You raise your grade in science from a C to an A. Well, that sounds like exciting news. That's great. How does that make you feel? You were asked to take care of your little sister all evening. Now for some, this may cause a sense of pride. Your parents finally trust you to do this. And for others, again, here comes that sense of dread, but I had plans, I have other things to do. A kid you hardly know offers you something that looks like candy. Hmm, now these are getting a little tougher. Your older brother offers you one of his cigarettes. Your friends ask you to steal vodka from your parents and bring it to a party. Your best friend wants you to meet her outside at 3 a.m. to wander around. Now for some of you, again, that might not be such a big deal if you live in the country like I do, but if you're in a more urban area, wandering around at 3 a.m. is not a good idea. Maybe that'll cause you to be a little scared. Everybody, your friends, your family are gone and you're home alone. Your friends give you an e-cig to smoke in class. He says it's so small, no one will even notice you're doing it. So did you feel strong statement or strong feelings to these statements? Did they make you happy, sad, excited, dreadful? What sort of feelings did these statements invoke in you? All of these feelings can influence our decisions. Let's have an example. For instance, you have a new puppy. You should be studying for a test, but your puppy looks so cute sitting there next to you and you just think maybe you should play with the puppy instead of studying for the test. These are feelings that are influencing that decision. If you were thinking logically, you would think maybe I could study for the test first and then play with the puppy. Your feelings though are gonna say, but he's so cute right now and he's so fluffy and soft and cuddly and I just wanna play with him. Decisions influenced by feelings. There are a lot of instances, especially in this time in your life, when you're going to be influenced by people around you, you're going to be influenced by your feelings, you're going to be influenced by a feeling or a sense of wanting to belong. These are all valid points but it's something that you need to be aware of as you're making a decision. We've gone through and talked about the decision-making process and the steps of them, which are identifying the decision to be made, 
identifying your options or your choices for that decision, maybe even brainstorming some other options or choices, maybe something you hadn't thought about previously. Looking at the positive and negative connotations for each of those choices. Thinking about the consequences that could come about from those choices. And then picking the best choice for you. No, nothing in there says anything about considering the, your feelings, but it is a part of decision making. And for many decisions, it may be best to try to set the feelings aside and look at it logically first, then maybe take into consideration those feelings. You're faced with a lot of decisions and choices right now. You have to think about your schoolwork. You have to think about maybe responsibilities that you have at home. It's not gonna be long before you're gonna start thinking about what you're gonna do after high school. Are you going to college? Are you going into the military? Are you gonna get a job right out of high school? These are all choices that you're gonna to have to think about and choices that you're gonna to have to make. In addition to those pressures and choices, you may have friends that are going to parties. You may have friends that are smoking or drinking, friends that are experimenting with different drugs. These choices are gonna to come to you too. They're not choices that you can really get away from. They're choices that are going to be staring you in the face. They're going to be in front of you all of the time. We've talked before about making informed decisions and about knowing as many facts as you can before you make those decisions. Looking at these decisions about whether to experiment with drugs, alcohol, or tobacco products is also very important. You need to make sure you have all of the information, that you are aware of the facts, so you can make a positive, informed decision. I hope this helps you, and I hope that you'll continue to use these decision-making steps as you move forward. There is a good deal of misinformation out there that youth are exposed to. You can use this activity to engage the youth in looking at facts. Ask the youth if everyone knows what a cigarette is. Now, what is an electronic cigarette? An electronic cigarette is also known as an e-cig, a vape pen, a jewel, or a mod. Ask the youth if they know other names for an e-cig. In the lesson today, they are going to explore the similarities and differences of electronic cigarettes and traditional cigarettes. They will learn that knowing the facts is helpful in making informed decisions, and they will explore the facts and fiction surrounding electronic cigarettes. Split the group into two teams. One team is Team E-Cig. The other team is Team Cigarette. Each group lists as many facts about the product they represent on sticky notes that they can think of. One idea per sticky note. Use a wall separated into three sections. After two minutes of brainstorming, ask the groups to fill their side of the wall with the sticky note comments. Make sure the common facts are put in the middle. Discuss the findings with the class. Share the significant similarities between e-cigs and traditional cigarettes. Both are tobacco products. Both contain nicotine. Nicotine is addictive. Both can be addictive. Both contain many chemicals. Both contain components that can cause cancer. Federal and state governments regulate both and the sale to minors is illegal because of the health risks. What did you notice about the similarities and differences? What can you determine from these comparisons? Have these comparisons changed your view of e-cigarettes? Why or why not? How can knowing the facts about e-cigarettes help you to make decisions not to use them? Ask the youth if they have ever had to make a tough decision. Examples could be a decision about saying no to using cigarettes or e-cigarettes or another substance. Did they choose the right option? Knowing the facts about the decision is an important step in making the right decision. Taking the time to practice making the decision is also a helpful factor. The more we practice doing something, the easier it becomes without having to stop and think about the steps involved. It is the same with decision-making. Practicing before you really need it will make you more skilled. Have youth divide into teams of three to five participants. 
Give each participant a copy of the Decisions, Decisions, Decisions worksheet. Have each team draw a Decisions, Decisions, Decisions situation from the stack. Each group is to use the situation they have drawn and go through the decision-making process on the Decisions, Decisions, Decisions worksheet. Have one participant in each group record the team's answers. They have 10 minutes to complete the process. When the teams have completed step six, ask them to share with the entire group what their situation was and what their final decision was. These questions may be used to lead a reflection on the lesson and activity from this lesson. How is your decision a safe decision? How do you know if you have all the information you need to make the decision? How could your decision hurt or help anyone, including yourself, physically, emotionally, and or socially? What is it like to come to a group decision? What were some of the things that made this harder or easier to do? How does working with others to make a decision make a difference? How does it feel to be faced with a difficult decision? Can your feelings get in the way of making a good decision? How does having the facts help in making a decision? Each week, the youth are being equipped with more strategies for making an informed decision. This week's summary reminds them that there are a few things to keep in mind in addition to the decision-making steps. With every decision that we make, we are faced with options and choices. To ensure that we are making the best possible decision, we need to be sure that we have all of the facts, that our emotions are in check, and that we have thought about the consequences of our choice. We should never be afraid to ask a trusted adult, mentor, or peer for help in making difficult decisions. For this week's 4-H activity, the youth will be given a chance to make a straw rocket. We will watch a video to help you with the construction of a straw rocket. For this activity, we're going to be making a straw rocket. What you will need is some tape, two straws, one larger than the other, scissors, some modeling clay, and some paper. The idea is the smaller straw will be your launcher, the larger straw will be your rocket. Once you slide the larger straw onto the smaller straw and have completed the construction, you'll be able to blow on the smaller straw and launch the larger straw rocket. To construct the straw rocket, you will first need to apply fins. Fins can be a variety of different shapes. I usually just use triangular fins. So I'm gonna cut three triangles from my paper and you want them to be of equal size. So put these out here. You can use three fins, you can use four fins, you can have shaped fins. There's a variety of ways to do this. You want to tape them to the bottom of your rocket. I'm not very good with tape. You want them to kind of stand up a little bit. So I now have my fins on the bottom of my rocket. 
The most important part of doing a straw rocket is the nose cone. There are two different ways you can do this. You can use modeling clay and form a nose cone that way. That is gonna make the front of your rocket a little nose heavy. So it could cause it to hit the ground a little faster than you might like it. The main thing is to make sure that no air escapes because that's what is going to allow you to launch your rocket. So you can do a nose cone, something like this. If you choose not to do it that way, you can use paper. And again, you would just want to, you want to be able to tape it uh, so that nothing can come out of it. And you can do this a couple of different ways if you wanted to try to have a point. Again, not very. So you can do something like this, and then we get a good amount of tape around there because you don't want air to escape because that will hamper the launching of your rocket. And I'll take that. The nice thing about these is you can try this over and over again. You can do modifications to see if you can get it better. Okay, so not a very pretty rocket, but hopefully it will be an effective rocket. And now we're ready to try to launch our rocket. If you have time after the youth have made their first model straw rocket, you can have them do modifications and try launching it again. Maybe they can try the modeling clay on the nose cone as a nose cone and see if that works. Or if they had the modeling clay the first time, maybe they can get that off and try using a paper nose cone and see if that helps it fly a little farther. They may want to change their fins. Maybe they'd like to add a fin, remove a fin. Maybe they'd like to see how it would fly with no fins. There's really not a right or wrong way to do this. It's all about having fun and using scientific method to try different alternatives and seeing what works best. So I hope you have fun with that. Thank you for completing the training for weeks 13 and 14. We ask that you please email Ashley when you have completed this video so she will know that your training is complete. And again, please turn in your attendance sheet after each weekly session. Thank you for all of your assistance.